Good morning, church. Good morning. Uh, it is so great to have you this morning as we worship our risen Savior. I would invite you to please stand uh, with, uh, with me as we uh, read a passage of Scripture taken out of the Psalter. Psalm chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. Let's recite together. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Thank you. You may be seated. Again, we are excited for you to join us this morning as we worship uh, our Lord Jesus. Um, if you're visiting with us, welcome. Uh, we're so glad that you're with us this morning at First Baptist Church of Monroe. Um, we um, uh, would ask that uh, you not be a stranger, and uh, hopefully you received a bulletin on your way in. We would love uh, to uh, get to know you, get to meet you, uh, learn a little bit more about you, your prayer needs, uh, anything ultimately that we can serve you in. Uh, please uh, don't hesitate to let us know. Let me draw your attention to a few uh, quick announcements here in our bulletin. Um, first off, uh, let me say that today is the baby shower for Allison and Zach Oswald. It's going to take place at 2 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Um, all is welcome, and uh, we, if you are able, we would love for you to join as we celebrate the Lord's blessing on the Oswalds, uh, blessing them with uh, a future child. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, a, a blessed time there. Uh, immediately after that, or maybe not immediately, but closely, I suppose, uh, afterwards, 6 p.m., we're going to be having our ladies' Bible study. I've heard uh, things went well and uh, so um, uh, last week, and so let's keep that uh, momentum going. This week, it's going to be the matchless uh, ladies' Bible study. Uh, again, that's tonight. It's going to be in the fellowship hall. Cross your fingers, right, in case... Uh, there's a, there's a little bit of logistical uh, problem with the uh, baby shower, but uh, we'll, uh, nevertheless, going to be Sunday uh, this evening at 6 p.m. Uh, for the ladies' Bible study. Um, also, uh, this Wednesday, we're going to have a WMU meeting, so um, uh, ladies uh, in uh, WMU, uh, please uh, take note of that this Wednesday, 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. And uh, choir practice, is this the first time we've been practicing for couple weeks. So there you go. It's worth announcing then, right? Because uh, it's been a while. So choir practice this Wednesday, 7 p.m. Uh, I'd love for you to uh, come out there and bless us with your beautiful angelic voices. So, uh, uh, and uh, that's all uh, the announcements that um, I have to share with you for the time being. Uh, let me see. Do I have uh, Deacon Kerry Wren? Is he somewhere close by? Oh, you call me yeah, first. come on up. <laughs> Surprise. Surprise, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Thank you. That's fine. It's always a blessing to pray before the Lord. I don't care. Whether given notice or not. You've got to be ready, haven't you? That's right. If you're not ready, today's your opportunity to get ready. That's all I'm telling you. So if the Lord's not, uh, if you're not saved by the Lord... Step forward today and be saved. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, dear Lord, what a blessing it is to be in your house. 
You have given us a beautiful day outside, dear Lord, and it's even a more beautiful day inside your house, dear God. Thank you for the freedom we have to come in and worship you without oppression, dear Lord, and just pray for those that give us uh, that freedom by potentially sacrificing their lives and serving for us, dear God. And Lord, as we come before you today, may we just be focused entirely on you, dear God, and your son, Jesus Christ, as we hear through song and word, dear Lord. And my prayer is that uh, everyone will draw closer to you today. And if there's one that has not yet confessed their love for you and want to follow you each and every day, I pray that today is the day that they will give their life to you, whether they give it where they sit or they come forward and profess their uh, just love for you and want to follow you in front of everyone, dear God. And Lord, uh, we want to pray for those that are, need your healing hand upon them. We know we will pray later and mention their names and ask your healing hand to be upon them. And also, dear Lord, we pray for the caretakers that uh, just have to give so much to, to care, take care of those in need. And dear God, we ask you to pray, uh, be, I mean, be with our country. We ask you to put your hand upon us. And we know that we need to bow down and follow you, dear Lord. And we pray that we will do that, that you will bless our country. We want to pray for the country of Israel today, dear Lord, that uh, you be with them as they have come under attack. Uh, we know you're, they're your chosen, your chosen land and your people, dear God, and we just uh, may we support them through prayer and other ways, dear Lord. And again, just uh, what a great opportunity it is to be here. What a blessing it is to be amongst all these fellow Christians, brothers and sisters, dear Lord. And I thank you for that. And uh, maybe we enjoy the fellowship of each other. First of all, enjoy the fellowship of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we thank you, dear God, for Jesus, uh, for allowing him to come on earth in human form, uh, to teach us how we should go. And Lord, we know that he suffered greatly for us, that he suffered so that our sins can be forgiven. He died on the cross so that we have an opportunity to have eternal life with you if we'll only profess him as our Lord and Savior and follow him each and every day. And dear God, we just thank you again for the celebration that we had a, just a week or two ago of uh, the resurrection, dear Lord, to know that... Uh, You've built a great mansion for us in heaven, and if we just believe in Jesus Christ, we will be there with him, worship him each and every day for eternity, dear Lord. And we thank you for that, and thank you for the leadership we have in this church through uh, Jessica and Song, uh, Mike and Kent and the Word, dear Lord, and be with Kent today as he delivers the message to us. May those words come through him and touch on our hearts, and we draw closer to thee. It's in Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. amen. As we mentioned last week, we were trying out some new software, so we're still trying it out. So just in case, uh, would you mind getting your hymn books out too? We're on 172, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. Stand and sing. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word Tell me the story most precious Sweetest that ever was heard Tell how the angels in chorus Sang as they welcomed his birth Glory to God Oh 
next hymn this morning is number 97, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. special time in our service where we get to approach our Heavenly Father in prayer. Carrie mentioned uh, the need to pray for uh, the nation of Israel in light of uh, the recent events that have uh, taken place, and we will continue to do that. Make no mistake, as we prayed last week for the salvation of Israel, there is a sense in which what they are experiencing today is indeed uh, part of God's plan to answer the prayer that we offer on their behalf, that the Lord would save them. Uh, it is through hardship that the Lord works salvation. Perhaps many of your own personal testimonies uh, can attest to that, that you came to the Lord Jesus through a tremendous hardship. There was some sort of deep traumatic experience that drew you uh, to the sweet message of the gospel. And in the same way, we do want to pray for the nation of Israel, that uh, they would be drawn to the sweet message of the gospel of their Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. In addition to that, I do want to draw your attention to a few other things on our prayer list. We release a prayer list weekly uh, just to keep track of the needs that um, arise in our church. We do believe that the Lord answers our prayers, and it is our joy to lift these needs uh, in behalf of one another. There are a number of families that are suffering uh, from loss uh, and so my heart goes out to you uh, just personally, and um, we do want to remember all of those who have lost loved ones over the past couple of weeks, those who have loved ones maybe who are on their deathbeds even now, uh, those who are ailing, those who uh, you think may not survive the year, whatever the case may be, we do want to pray uh, for the families uh, of those uh, who have passed. We want to pray uh, for the Lord's comfort uh, over uh, you families that have experienced uh, your loss, and uh, we uh, find it our privilege to do that. We also want to continue to pray for those who uh, are uh, approaching surgery, various surgeries uh, I know that are coming up. Those are mentioned here, uh, or surgeries that have already happened. Of course, uh, continue to pray for uh, Deacon Harold. Uh, I didn't see him uh, today. Is he here? 
No? So he is uh, 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 having ongoing uh, cancer treatment, so we do want to continue to pray for him. We also see that Sylvia uh, has uh, had surgery on her uh, wrist coming up uh, for uh, uh, April 23rd, and so we do want to keep her uh, in our prayers, as well as uh, Jeff uh, has a shoulder surgery coming up here pretty soon, and so uh, there's plenty of uh, uh, surgeries that are taking place. And, um, uh, of course, uh, continue to pray for Jerry and uh, the uh, ongoing treatment that uh, he is receiving as well. Pray for uh, Mark, Mark Wood. Um, he uh, just recently had knee surgery, and so uh, he is recovering uh, from that. We want to uh, keep him in our prayers as well. And um, uh, one name that's been added to the list here, uh, Dan and Elva. Um, uh, they uh, have a great-grandson, 15 months old, uh, who right now is suffering from kidney cancer. 15 months old, and so tremendous uh, hardship, I know, for that family. Um, we say it all the time, it's too young, right? And it's a, it's a testament to the broken world, the fallen world that we live in, that even these things that we assume that uh, best case scenario we experience maybe in the last year of our lives, after a nice full life of relatively little hardship. We assume that uh, those diseases would come, you know, as late as that, and to see them befall children uh, so young. It is truly heartbreaking and definitely worthy of our prayers. Uh, on that note, let's continue to pray for Trey Hargis, uh, Sean and Cynthia Hargis, uh, uh, their son, Trey, uh, still battling uh, various health issues, and uh, so uh, many health uh, uh, needs to uh, bring before the Lord this morning. There's one final thing I would like to ask that we pray for this morning, and that is, I want you to think in your lives of just one person, one person in your life who you just know does not believe the gospel. One person who, if they were to die today, you are not certain that they would spend eternity in heaven. One person who um, has rejected the Lord Jesus. One person who has rejected um, Christianity, the gospel message. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a lifelong friend. Maybe it's somebody you just met. Whoever that is, that one person you have in your mind, I want you to uh, think of them. And we're going to go to the Lord and we're going to pray for those individuals uh, that we have on our minds. That the Lord would save them. That the Lord would um, breathe new life into their hearts. That their heart of stone would be turned into a heart of flesh. And that they would come to enjoy the sweet uh, message of salvation that is made available in the gospel that we preached. One person, think of that person in your mind, and think of that person as we now go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, our hearts go out to all of those in our church who are suffering, suffering from all of the various uh, physical hardships that they face in their lives, resulting in surgeries, resulting in uh, discomfort, resulting in even pending death, resulting in even death for our loved ones. Father, we pray for those in our midst who are struggling right now with the uh, trial of living in this sin-cursed world and having to bear up, Father, uh, with the consequences of that through death, disease, and physical hardship. Father, we pray uh, for those who cannot be with us this morning, those who maybe as a result of their hardship, they uh, are at home, homebound, who are watching from a distance, we pray, Father, for their safety. We pray for their healing. We pray for their blessing as they enjoy this service, Father, even from a distance. And we pray, Father, that you would bring them back to us because it is so good to be together as the people of God. 
and to lift our voices in unison to our great King, the Lord Jesus. Father, we eagerly look forward to the return of our King, Israel's Messiah. And we remember Israel this morning, Father, in light of the hardship that they face. Father, we pray ultimately for their salvation. You have called them, Father, to be a kingdom of priests. And we yearn to see them saved. Because we know that their salvation is a testament to your faithfulness. And it is your faithfulness that we preach. It is your faithfulness that we celebrate week in and week out. Your good name will not be tarnished. And it is with the confidence of that that we pray for the nation of Israel. And likewise as well, on the basis of your faithfulness to that nation, we pray, Father, for the salvation of our loved ones, those whom we now have on our minds, our friends, our family members, our co-workers, many, Father, that we have had conversations with, many of those maybe that we have been too timid to have conversations with, but our hearts nevertheless yearn for their salvation. Father, we pray that the gospel would be heard by these people and that, Father, they would be saved. We join with the Apostle Paul, as he said, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they may be saved. Father, that is our prayer. We remember them this day. May this day, Father, be a day of salvation. As you hear our prayer, and we have the confidence that you are already at work, Father, in bringing about the answer to the prayer we offer now. We thank you for this time, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Yes, indeed, how great is our God. If you have your Bibles, I would invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 11. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. While you're turning there, let me ask you this question. What is the most versatile everyday object we barely ever think about? Perhaps there are many that come to mind for you. I would like to propose to you a knife is the most versatile everyday object we barely ever think about. A knife comes in many shapes and sizes, many forms. A knife we typically think of as that which can be used to prepare delicious meals of all varieties, whether that's mom's home-cooked favorites or even, you know, famous award-winning chefs. A knife can be used to carve tremendous uh, works of art, artistic masterpieces in the form of wood carvings, in the form of uh, sculptures. A knife can be used actually to start a fire with a little bit of flint. And a knife can be used as well to prepare the wood that keeps that fire going. A knife can be used to beautify your home. We use knives in the form of lawnmowers, uh, in the form of uh, uh, trimmers for um, bushes, pruning, and that sort of thing. A knife can be used to beautify your appearance. I used one this morning on my face, right? A knife can be used for, technically it is used for trimming your hair. A knife can be used as a tool when others are not available. Sometimes we use them as a screwdriver. We could use it as a hammer, just turn it over and maybe even a shovel. Maria uh, brags that she uses one as a, a can opener. <laughs> a knife can be used to sharpen other knives. Keep the fun going. A knife can be used to perform life-saving surgery. Perhaps you are the beneficiary of a successful surgeon who used a knife skillfully. And just as easily as a knife can save an individual's life, a knife could just as easily take one away. With a knife, we could conquer an army. We could turn nations. Most importantly, as far as scripture is concerned, a knife can be used to change a heart. Hebrews chapter 4 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Scripture is cast as a knife in this passage, and that knife is used with great precision to change a human heart. Scripture is a very powerful instrument, and it is Scripture that I want to draw our attention to. I want to begin a series of sermons called Scripture According to Jesus. At this church, we must strive to maintain a high view of Scripture, to honor the Bible as our highest priority, not because it's what seems to make the best sense, practically speaking, not because even it's what we've always done as a church, praise God, though that may be. A high view of Scripture is important because it is precisely the view of Scripture that Jesus himself held. And it is precisely the view of Scripture that he expects of us as his followers. To say it differently, a commitment to follow Christ is a commitment to believe that Scripture is what he believes uh, it to be. 
So what exactly then did Jesus believe about Scripture? I want to take uh, the next few sermons that I will be preaching to unpack this basic question. What did Jesus believe about Scripture? We see this come out in his ministry. As he used Scripture, as he appealed to Scripture, as he wielded Scripture to accomplish his purposes, we see precisely what it is that Jesus' thoughts believed about Scripture. The Baptist Faith and Message says that Scripture is a perfect treasure of divine instruction. The supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. In a word, theologians say, Scripture is sufficient. It is sufficient. It is, it contains everything that we must know, everything that we must believe, and everything that we must do with our lives as the people of God. Scripture alone is sufficient for accomplishing these things. And Jesus demonstrates his commitment to the sufficiency of Scripture in this text that we will now read. And that is his temptation in the wilderness. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness. Peculiarly, then Jesus, we're parachuting right into this passage. Just a few verses prior, however, Matthew records the baptism of our Lord Jesus in a glorious moment that is, wherein it says, the Holy Spirit descended upon him in his moment of baptism, like a dove. And the voice in heaven was heard, saying, this is my beloved son. So a very triumphant moment, an inaugural moment for Jesus' ministry. And Mark's gospel records immediately after this baptism, that same spirit that descended upon Jesus like a dove led Jesus here into the wilderness. Why? The rest of the verse says, to be tempted by the devil. It almost seems to suggest that there was a plan that the Spirit had cooking up. And indeed, that is the case. We can understand this just by looking at this idea of him being driven into the wilderness. This is actually a very familiar experience for the nation of Israel. We go back to the Old Testament and we see in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses is recalling what got the work that God had done with the nation in driving them into the wilderness. He says, the Lord your God has led you into the wilderness these 40 years that he might, his purpose being that he might humble you testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandment or not. The nation of Israel was driven into the wilderness for that purpose, to test them, to prune their hearts, to ensure whether it is uh, they would follow after their God. And tragically, we know the story. So many of them proved not to be faithful to their God, I believe Matthew has this experience in mind as he recounts this event. And we see here that Jesus does what his ancestors could not do. Jesus, the ultimate Israelite, will succeed where Israel failed. And how will he do this? By a masterful use of Scripture and a dedication to this idea that scripture is the sufficient means needed to overcome 
whatever hardship or temptation one might face. Look at verse 2. And after fasting, 40 days and 40 nights. Fasting here, very significant uh, discipline. And Jesus' uh, example is very instructive of fasting. Jesus was being tempted by the devil, it said in verse 1. And his temptation apparently got very severe. So severe, in fact, that he was driven to the point of fasting. That is to say, he was driven to the point of giving up his own physical sustenance. No food, no water, for 40 days and 40 nights. He surrendered himself. He yielded his faculties to God, his Father, to sustain him in his moment of need. Suffice it to say, verse 2 says, he was hungry. It seems a little bit of an overstatement. I don't know how many of you have fasted before, but it, it gets pretty tough. Um, if you commit yourself to doing it, usually uh, if you can survive, the, they say if you can survive three days, it gets a little easier, but it's still very difficult even as time progress, uh, progresses. To fast 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, that probably implies that um, there was no readily available food or water. And he was hungry, a testament to his human nature, no doubt. In verse 3, the tempter, that is the devil, came and said to him, If you are the Son of God... The expression son of God there is actually pretty important. That uh, uh, harkens us back to the baptism. It's almost as if the devil is saying, I saw this little triumphant moment that you just had here. You were declared to be God's son. Okay, so you are God's son. Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus was tempted to put his own desire for food ahead of what God commissioned him to do. God, in his own sovereign purpose, led his son into the wilderness by his spirit in order that he may be proven faithful, the faithful Israelites, the ultimate Israelites. And so it was therefore necessary that he remain committed to the mission God had prescribed for him. But here, Satan provides him the opportunity to put his physical needs ahead of his spiritual needs, the spiritual need to obey his father's will. And notice what he says, verse 4. He answered, it is written. In his moment of trial, in his moment of temptation, where is the first place that he looks? The scripture itself. It is written, he says, man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The annoyance of food is that as good as the meal is, it doesn't last, right? Uh, Many of us are going to disperse and maybe go out uh, for a nice lunch this afternoon and come, you know, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, you're going to feel the need for hunger again. And that need is constant, Maybe uh, in between the meals, there's that need for a snack. Um, Five, six, seven, eight meals, if we're being honest, every day that we eat. And perhaps we could still say it's not enough. Uh, We are constantly in need of sustaining our lives with physical food, water, etc. But here, in verse 4, the passage that Jesus cites reminds us that the spiritual nourishment is far superior. 
the spiritual nourishment of the word of God is the nourishment that provides the genuine satisfaction that we need. Yes, we will continue to yearn for it, in fact, if the word is doing what it's supposed to do. Just like a good meal uh, withers away, we find ourselves in constant need of the word of God. As we face the various trials that we do in our lives, we face the hardships that we do, we need the word of God constantly, just as a good meal. But the nourishment that we receive from the meal, from the food of Scripture, far surpasses anything that a three-course dinner could ever accomplish. And in response to his temptation, Jesus acknowledged that God's expressed will for his life was sufficient in this moment to sustain him through his physical hardship. The people of God often follow Jesus' example here by reading their Bible to their own hurt. I was intrigued to find uh, many examples of this uh, in my study this week. One French nobleman, it is said, read the Bible daily for three hours, so daily for three hours, on his knees and uncovered head. One British noblewoman, for the last seven years of her life, so let's just say uh, her retirement years, read the Bible twice yearly. One man I read about carried a small pocket Bible, which he read over 120 times over the course of his life. Another I read about read the whole Bible through in a single year, 12 times over. This one's my favorite and most demonstrative of Jesus' example. A prisoner confined in a dungeon was said to have no light in the prison cell except for a few moments when food was brought in from the outside. And it was in those moments he would use the light to read his Bible, saying that he could find his mouth in the dark, but he could not read in the dark, and he was so desperate to read the scripture. There is someone who understands the spiritual nourishment far surpasses the physical, following after Jesus' example. Well, in verse 5, we see that the devil sees that uh, he's going to have to up the ante. Then the devil took him to the holy city, that is Jerusalem. The devil took him, how? It's hard to know exactly. Was he physically led there? Did he go there on his own and the devil met him there? Lots of Bible interpreters say lots of different things about this. But regardless... He's at the holy city and is set on the pinnacle of the temple. Literally, the little wing of the temple or the outer edge. Most people understand this to be uh, the southeastern tip of uh, that temple structure, that giant structure of Herod's temple, top of the royal portico. Uh, this was a roughly 50-foot structure upon which Jesus was placed. The Temple Mount itself was over a hundred feet below the, I'm sorry, the foundation of the Temple Mount was over a hundred feet below the actual temple structure. So we're talking 150 feet roughly. And then on top of that, this temple overlooked a valley, the Kidron Valley, the depth of the valley itself, estimated maybe at around 300 feet. So from top to bottom, from, the, uh, from where Jesus was to the very bottom, the ground, roughly 450, 500 feet. I was curious to know just how long a distance that was. So I said, how high is the LU Tower? Have you guys been to the LU Tower? 
to the very top. Every time I go, I get uh, butterflies in my stomach. I just can't, uh, I'm very fearful of heights. And um, I go up there, I say, okay, I've done it. Let's, let's go back down, right? I, I've seen it. Um, beautiful view, but uh, I'll enjoy it uh, somewhere else. Um, the LU Tower is roughly about 275 feet, according to the source I saw. So you can roughly double that. And that's how high up Jesus is in this moment. Josephus actually records, the Jewish historian from the first century, he says, if anyone looked down from the top, the point where Jesus was standing, he would be giddy, while a sight could not reach to such an immense depth. In other words, there's no possible way you could even see the ground below you because of how high that really was. And the devil says to him at this moment, verse 6, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written. Notice what Satan does here. Oh, you're going to use scripture, are you? Well, two can play at that game. You are the son of God, so God the Father has said. Well, throw yourself down because God has said, it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Interesting that Satan resorts to scripture. To my knowledge, this is the only instance in the entire Bible where Satan is presented as quoting scripture. It's fitting. He's desperate. But he uses scripture here, unwieldy, quoting Psalm 91, a passage that indeed does promise the Lord's protection over those who love him, surely Jesus himself. Verse 7, Jesus said to him, again, it's almost as if he is saying, but aha, you forgot, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus was tempted to put God's revealed word to the test. Jesus knew what scripture said. The scripture that was even quoted to him here. He knew full well what it said, what it meant. And the temptation was to see God's word in action. Put it to the test. As if God's word was not sufficient enough to be believed without some tangible confirmation of its truthfulness. But in response, he recognized that God's word was sufficient to be received as a testament to who God was. No need to test it. If believers truly had the Holy Spirit within them, they should be able to handle rattlesnakes without fear. Caught your attention, didn't I? That's actually the belief of some who are part of uh, this sort of obscure sect in the holiness movement. Apparently they made a practice out of handling rattlesnakes. There was even a snake handling evangelist who was doing a revival service of some sort, and tragically this evangelist was bitten by one of his own snakes in the middle of his sermon. This evangelist tried to continue speaking, but he eventually collapsed and died tragically minutes later. The pastor of the church that uh, this evangelist was speaking at later did an interview and he said, you know, a lot of people just don't understand us. We are just normal people like anyone else but we believe God's word. God's word says something about handling snakes? Well, apparently Mark 16, verse 18, likely the passage that they are thinking of, they will pick up serpents with their hands, and if they drink any deadly poison, it will not hurt them. Of course, we see this play out in the life of Paul. 
And so, you know, some people were led to think that, yes, we can handle snakes. But in this moment, we see a very, in this example, we see a very foolish uh, putting of God's word to the test. This is not a license to play with snakes, but rather simply a promise of the Lord's protection as we seek to accomplish the Lord's will for our lives. And that lesson is one that Jesus knew full well, hence his response to Satan. Well, we move on in verse 8. Again, the devil's not over. Uh, Took him to a very high mountain. Peculiar to see uh, see that, because, well, he was just at the temple, right? Very high mountain. How high is this mountain? Well, the most, uh, the highest mountain in the region, in the Near East, is apparently 9,000 feet. Mount Hermon. Was it there, maybe, that he was taken? Not sure. But it was apparently high enough that Satan, that he gets a good view of uh, the landscape, the nations of the earth, the Villages, the towns, the kingdoms. And Satan shows him, it says, all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And Satan says, all these I will give you. Notice here he doesn't even now question, you are the son. The prior two, he said, if you are the son. But here he just says, all right, enough of this son business. There's no need to question this anymore. All these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Peculiar expression. Fall down and worship. The last time we saw in the Gospel of Matthew falling down and worship was the wise men who came to the child Jesus and fell down and worshipped him. Ironic. The Lord Jesus had already received worship from these nations. But we must understand, as Messiah, Jesus is heir to all of it, all of these nations. I will rise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king, the prophet Jeremiah says, Famous passage uh, that we quote around Christmas time, Isaiah 9. Of the, right, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. And if you remember the last time I preached, Psalm 2, verse 8. God the Father says, ask of me and I will, God the Father speaking, I will make you, son, the nations, your, inherit, uh, your inheritance. And so Jesus is rightly heir to this uh, kingdom, to this world. But Satan in this moment says, here's your opportunity to get it early. Here's your opportunity to build a kingdom without having to, you know, do the Via Della Rosa. Without having to deal with sin. The suffering bit, the cross the being crushed for our iniquities, we can forget all that. You can have your kingdom right here, right now. Just bow down and worship me. It's a very laughable proposition when we consider, you know, Satan is speaking as if he has some sort of ownership here. At best, he is an influencer over the kingdoms of this world, but he does not possess this world. There is nothing in this world that is that he can lay claim to as genuinely his. It is all God the Father's and it will be all God the Son's. Nevertheless, he gives the proposition and what does Jesus say in response? Be gone, Satan! Tragic. This is the same expression we find in Matthew chapter 16, that Jesus will say to Peter, tragic that Peter would put himself in such a position, be gone, Satan, for 
It is written. Again, Scripture is the remedy. Scripture is the all-sufficient thing that we need in this moment of temptation. It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Quoted from Deuteronomy chapter 6, which was Moses' exhortation to Israel to maintain wholehearted, complete devotion to God. Again, Jesus in this moment proves himself to be the far superior Israelite. Upon being driven into the wilderness and being tested, he comes out triumphant. We see in verse 11 this beautiful image, then the devil left him. He had enough. And behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Don't overlook that. What did Satan quote just a few verses prior? He quoted Psalm 91. He will command his angels concerning you. And he tried to twist that to force Jesus into doing something that would have violated his purpose as God's son. But God's son, our Lord Jesus, stayed faithful to the sufficiency of scripture. And in the end, God honored his word. God honored precisely what he had said he would do. In other words, God's, the sufficiency of Scripture, God confirmed in this moment. Jesus held fast to what Scripture had commanded, to what Scripture taught concerning his life, concerning his God, concerning his worship. He held fast to Scripture's regulation, and in the end, God honored his word to his benefit. Angels came and ministered unto him. One Sunday evening, a preacher was delivering a sermon on the subject of temptation. The church was located not far from Blackfriars Bridge, which was a bridge built uh, in the Victorian era, uh, situated on the Thames in London. And in the heat of the moment, this preacher, preaching on the subject of temptation, looks to the back of the sanctuary and says, perhaps there is someone here so miserable as to think of throwing himself over this bridge, saying to himself, it's too late to tell me not to enter into temptation. I have done it. I am in it. There's no hope for me. I need a way out. The preacher said, there is hope. Christ died for you, and he will forgive. He will save even you. It doesn't matter how far in you've fallen. Well, unbeknown to him, on that same night, there was a woman who had made up her mind to throw herself over that very bridge. She, in that moment, thought it was just too bright outside, that if she attempted to do it uh, early in the evening, as she had planned, she was likely to be stopped by police. And so in order to wait it out, to wait for darkness to set, she decided to mosey on into this very church to pass the time. And as the preacher spoke, she said that she felt as though he had called to her directly to stop. And in that moment, she came to Christ. She went back to her home to pray, and she lived the rest of her life a faithful Christian. Beloved, wherever you are at right now, you compare your life to the example of Jesus and you see, I have not followed this example. I have not faced temptation uh, with much success. There is no hope for me. I am in the temptation and I am losing. Beloved, 
I echo the words of this preacher, there is hope. Christ indeed died for you. He can save even you. Follow Jesus' example as we have seen it here. Entrust yourself to God's all-sufficient word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the example of our Lord Jesus. His commitment to your word, Father, in his moment of trial. And we pray, Father, that as we face the temptation to sin, to dishonor you, to dishonor your name, to sin against your holy character and righteous standard, we pray, Father, that we would overcome that temptation by your grace, following the example of our Lord, relying on the all-sufficient scripture, and beholding your faithfulness to what you have said. Father, we are weak in our flesh. Oftentimes we overlook the reality of how faithful you are. We pray that you would help us, that you would give us the grace, the confidence, Father, to know that you will be faithful to what you have said. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We now want to enter into a time of invitation. Beloved, I encourage you to heed what I have just said. There is indeed hope. If you are in need this morning of prayer, please come. If you are in need of surrendering your life to Christ, please come. How about you have surrendered your life to Christ, but you have found yourself constantly defeated in your moment of temptation? Come, rededicate your life. If you would like to join our church, we invite you, come. Jessica. Let's stand and sing hymn 376, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. Great sermon, Pastor Kent. Thank you. And how important that the word is central to the believer's life. You don't, you don't feed yourself one Sunday afternoon and quit, do you? You, you? We eat all week long. So too, feed on the word all week long. It's more important than physical nourishment. Feed on that word all week long. God bless you. Uh, as we worship today, now we depart to serve to represent him well out in the world. So let's pray together. Our Lord, our God, we thank you for these moments, Lord. Thank you for the, the word of God that centered us, centers us on knowing and living the word of God. 
Certainly, Jesus himself depended on the word through every step of his earthly life. And we pray, Father, through the steps of our earthly life that the word of God will be our roadmap, will be our signal of the way to go, Father, the light that we follow. And so, Father, we thank you for the word of God that sets our path before us and a Savior who loves us, the Spirit of God who lives in us that we might live for you. Father, today, thank you for the time that we have worshiped together, all of us being part of the family of God here, everyone in this sanctuary, everyone who has been watching online and who will watch online in this week to come. Bless us, we pray, as the people of God, and may we represent you well as we walk into the world as your witnesses. We love you, we thank you, we trust you, and we pray your blessing upon us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.